1989, the original Game Boy was released, and 12 long years later, Nintendo finally released a proper follow-up to the Game Boy line in the form of the Game Boy Advance. And then just a few years after the Game Boy Advance was released, the DS came along and the rest is history. So why did the GBA come out as late as it did? Were Nintendo planning to release it a lot sooner? Well basically yes, Nintendo was actually planning to release a successor to the original Game Boy in 1996, but that fell through and we got the Game Boy Color a few years later instead. So in this video I'm going to take you on a deep dive of the history of the Game Boy Advance. Let's get started. So the story of the GBA's development actually begins in 1994. The Game Boy had already been out for five years at that point, and it was about time for Nintendo to start coming up with plans for a true successor. Nintendo were in talks with a British chip manufacturer called ARM to supply some new chips for their next generation handheld, tentatively titled Project Atlantis, because they were planning to originally release the system in 1996 to coincide with the Atlanta Olympic Games. Rumours began circulating about the Atlantis in magazines around the time, it did seem extremely ambitious, probably too ambitious. Apparently it would have featured a 32-bit CPU and been capable of 3D graphics rivaling the PlayStation and Saturn, and have a 30-hour battery life. That all sounds way too good to be true, especially in 1994. After a while, the rumours began to die down, and Nintendo kept releasing new upgrades to their Game Boy lineup, including the Game Boy Pocket, the Game Boy Light, which was a Japanese exclusive system that actually came with a backlight. As you can see, my screen's a little bit damaged, I need to get that replaced at some point. And then of course, like I mentioned in the intro, the Game Boy Color too. But the Game Boy Color wasn't really a generational leap like a lot of people would have hoped based on the rumours. And if there was any doubt that Project Atlantis was the Game Boy Color, Howard Lincoln of Nintendo of America actually shot that rumour down in an interview that he did with GameSpot around the release of the Game Boy Color. So yes, Atlantis was its own 32-bit project, completely separate to the Game Boy Color, which I'll be covering in a future video. Apart from a few small mentions of the name, Nintendo never really acknowledged the existence of the Atlantis. That was until 2009 when the prototype console was casually shown off in a GDC talk by Masoto Kurahawa, the designer of the DSi. Although the talk's only been uploaded in Japanese, it didn't stop me watching the entire thing, and there's also a load of other really interesting prototypes and development hardware that he actually shown off in there, which I would love to cover in the future. And although it did look quite bonky in those early pictures, honestly it's not much difference in size compared to the Game Gear or the Lynx back in the day, so... For a comparison, here's kind of how the Atlantis would have looked if it did come out back in 1996 as planned. And just for fun, I actually took a photo of my Switch OLED and compared that with the DSi as well. And it's really crazy to think that Nintendo now has a handheld that's actually bigger than the Atlantis would have been back then. How times change, I guess. And the design of the Atlantis with its four face buttons kind of reminds me of something like the Analog Pocket, which is actually a really nice and comfortable handheld. So it is such a shame that it never got released because I still think it would have done really well. But there was something even more interesting than that GDC talk, which I found while I was researching for this video. And it's actually something that cements those magazine rumors as fact. The video in question was a 2019 interview with Dave Jagger, who was responsible for the development of the ARM architecture in the 90s. He actually stated in this video that he worked with Nintendo in 1994 on an upcoming project, which would have been the Project Atlantis. And I presume he stayed around and worked with Nintendo on the actual Game Boy Advance as well. A lot of people think that uh, the, the chip that this became was for Nokia. It actually wasn't, it was for Nintendo. And back then, games cartridges plugged in and they were basically a bit of plastic, a tiny little bit of brass, and a stack of memory. So on a train from uh, Nintendo to a ski weekend at Matsumoto in 1994, and literally on a napkin, uh, I started writing uh, uh, the 16-bit instruction set. It was pretty much the same one that I used in my thesis. And around the time when he was working with Nintendo in 1994, that's just after ARM had released the ARM 7 chipset, which is what the magazine said the Atlantis was going to be running on. So I was so happy to find this piece of information and everything suddenly clicked together and forms a really good picture of what the system could have been like. He actually goes into loads of detail about how exactly all those chips worked, and eventually the chips that were used in the GBA a bit later on too, so I definitely recommend giving it a watch after if you're interested in some of the technical details. 
The Atlantis is such a fascinating glimpse into what could have been, and I honestly believe that releasing such a powerful handheld in the 90s would have completely changed the landscape of handheld consoles at the time. Maybe things like the Wonderswan or the Neo Geo Pocket would have been completely different systems, or maybe been a lot more powerful. Maybe Sega would have carried on its handheld line and released a true successor to the Game Gear. I love to speculate about all these possibilities, and apparently I'm not the only one. I found this absolutely amazing website, which is basically dedicated to things like this. Someone actually created an entire possible future timeline if Nintendo had released the Atlantis. It goes into so much detail, it was just an absolutely fascinating read. It's a ridiculous site and people have spent so much time coming up with these things. Anyway, back to reality now, and we're moving forward a few years to 1996. And in the intervening years while Nintendo were experimenting with the new ARM processor and the possibility of a 32-bit handheld, the original Game Boy was still going strong, and the Atlantis project was ultimately cancelled in favour of extending the original Game Boy's life a little bit longer with upgrades like the Pocket, the Light and the Colour, alongside games like Pokemon which really helped it in its later years. But by the late 90s, the technology in the Game Boy and Game Boy Color was definitely looking a bit long in the tooth, and Nintendo finally had some true competition, with things like the Bandai Wonder Swan, which were actually designed by the creator of the Game Boy, which I'll be covering in a future video as well. It wasn't actually until 1998 and the release of the Game Boy Color that Nintendo finally started working properly on the Game Boy Advance as we know it today. It took them two years to develop and finish the Game Boy Advance internally, and then another year to bring it to market in 2001. There are a lot of similarities with the Game Boy Advance and the cancelled Atlantis project which came before it. They both feature an ARM chip, the Atlantis was going to feature the ARM 710, and the Game Boy Advance features the slightly upgraded version, which is the ARM 7 DMI. There was actually an Iwata Ask style interview on Nintendo's Japanese website just before the launch of the GBA to give a glimpse into its development, and I managed to track down the original site and translate it into English, and here's some of the most interesting information that I found on there. The first year of the development was focused on defining the CPU specs and the screen size. Interestingly, they mentioned the fact that having a widescreen was going to help towards porting console games to the system. But as we all know, the GBA mostly ended up having ports of SNES games and the occasional PS1 title, but none of those were in widescreen. So the fact that they chose a widescreen for the handheld for the reason of having ports and then the fact that the ports didn't really fit very well onto the screen is a little bit of a strange reason to go for widescreen. I honestly think it's because widescreen was becoming the norm in TVs at the time and they just thought it looked a bit more futuristic and maybe it was more of a sales pitch thing than an actual improvement to the gameplay. And like we all know now, a few years later with the DS, they actually went back to the old 4x3 style aspect ratio instead. And it actually makes playing GBA games on the DS a little bit strange because you have big black bars at the top and the bottom. The SNES ports, because of this widescreen and the slightly reduced resolution compared to a TV, were actually all scaled in a little bit if they wanted to retain the same size of the sprites, so it did kind of come at the detriment to the gameplay. But obviously the games that were built specifically for the Game Boy Advance take great advantage of that extra screen space. Another part of the interview talks about some of the design challenges with the system, and it's really interesting to read that even back in the late 90s when they were designing the GBA, they actually tried to go with a clamshell design like the SP ended up having, but apparently it was just too thick and too bonky with the technology at the time, so it's really cool that they did go back and revisit that, and of course the GBA SP today is known as one of the best designs for the Game Boy out of any Game Boy really. It just looks so sleek and futuristic even today. They also discussed the fact that the system was designed to be the next evolution of 2D pixel art graphics rather than going down the 3D route which would have drained the battery considerably. Interestingly, this final design for the original Game Boy Advance was actually designed externally by a company in Tokyo called Curiosity. I was having a look on their website and it seems like they're actually mostly focused on architecture projects, but I did also find some really interesting products that they designed, including this feature phone from 2009 which I think looks really sleek. And like someone on Twitter pointed out to me, it actually resembles the Game Boy Micro quite a lot which is really cool to see. Let me know in the comments whether you actually like the design of the original Game Boy Advance, and let me know what you think about the design of this phone too. 
1999, Nintendo finally started sending out dev kits to potential developers for the GBA. The game and website IGN actually got a hands-on with one of these boards for an article they were writing about the system before its release. The boards at the time were known as the GBA Target Board TS2, standing for Test System. It's really interesting to see what the developers would have been working on at the time. This TS2 board was actually built upon the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color dev kits, which also used this same flat circuit design. The board used a modified SNES controller to be able to control the game, and had a GBA LCD screen on the board itself, so developers could actually see what it would look like running on the real system. The YouTube channel Hard For Games did a fantastic video on this, looking at it in extreme detail. It's also one of my favourite channels, too. I absolutely love seeing all of the prototype stuff that he manages to get. It's so fascinating, so definitely go and check that channel out after you've watched this video. And then a little bit later on, a much more professional looking dev kit, made by Intelligent Systems at Nintendo, was actually sent out to publishers and developers. This one had a GBA cart slot, and it had an optional GBA link where developers could actually play their games and debug it on the computer at the same time, which must have been really useful. There's another great channel called Behind the Code, which did a fantastic rundown of everything that this Intelligent Systems dev kit can do. As well as these, there are a few other interesting dev devices that I found, which I'll show on the screen briefly, and I would love to try and get some of this stuff someday. You can find out about most of this at the website called Retroversing.com, and I definitely recommend checking it out if you're into this sort of stuff like I am. Things must have been really exciting internally at Nintendo, because in 2000, they were finally going to be ready to show off the Game Boy Advance, so let's move forward to the year 2000 and see what the launch of the system was like. So we're now in the year 2000, and Nintendo actually decided not to show anything of the Game Boy Advance, or the GameCube for that matter, at E3 that year, because they were saving everything for their very own event in Japan called Space World instead. This was a very special event for Nintendo. The event actually spanned several days, and it was open to the public as well as the press. And thanks to this incredible video, we can actually see exactly what it was like inside at the time. I always imagined Space World to be kind of a dark show, with nothing more than a main stage and maybe a few booths to play on some of the announced games, but this actually looks like a much bigger and brighter event than I ever imagined. It even had its own Nintendo merch store at the show too. I would have just absolutely loved to go to something like this as a kid, it must have been so exciting. In terms of the Game Boy Advance at the show though, there were some very interesting differences between the GBA that was shown off then, and the final product that came out a year later. Both in terms of the games on show and the hardware. There was a bunch of unreleased colour variants for the system at Space World, including this clear one here with blue buttons, a silver one with blue buttons, a clear purple one with orange buttons, and technically a brown D-pad and shoulder buttons and orange A and B buttons, but you can't quite tell in this video, but again, Hard For Games did a fantastic video where it actually shows the very subtle difference between them. And there was also a silver version with orange buttons as well, which actually looks like it has the same sort of brown D-pad and shoulder buttons as the purple one. And as well as those ones at the show, there was actually one other pre-release colour that never saw the light of day, and that was this berry red version here, which actually came with some development kits. It's such a shame that we didn't get get these brighter colours for the Game Boy Advance, because the ones that did come out at launch were a lot more dull in comparison. We did end up getting one quite similar to the Berry Red one, but it was a very rare system that you could only get from one specific store in Canada, and it's actually thought that only around a thousand of these actually exist today. A few months after Space World in Japan, Nintendo actually came to the UK to a show called ECTS to show off the same systems there too. And the reception to it at both events was extremely positive. It's so cool to see something so important to Nintendo's history actually being held at a place that I've actually been to for shows myself. I really wish I could have gone there as a kid. The first show that I ever went to personally was a show called Game Stars Live, which was also in London, just around the release of the DS, which I'll be covering in my DS history video coming very soon. So if you are enjoying this, then let YouTube know by giving me a thumbs up and a subscribe. And now let's get back on to some more game Boy Advance history. Around this time too, Nintendo also began sending out something called the Wide Boy 64 to the press. 
This was actually a device that allows you to capture gameplay and screenshots from the Game Boy Advance to use in things like commercials or in magazines for printing the screenshots out. There was also an Intelligent Systems version as well, which looks a lot like the dev kit from before, but this one was strictly for capturing gameplay. By the end of 2000, hype was really building for the launch of the system the next year. And I was so excited for the launch as well. It was actually the first console that I ever got on launch, and I could not have been happier. It launched here in the UK on June 22nd, 2001, and here is a photo of me on launch day with my original Game Boy Advance. I don't know why I was posing like that, but I was so happy to get it. The games that I got on launch were Rayman Advance and Pino B Wings of Adventure. Kind of strange choices for launch games, and a bit later on, I did also get Mario Advance and F-Zero Maximum Velocity 2, and it quickly became my favourite handheld console. And especially the fact that you could go back and play some original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games was just fantastic. So the Game Boy Advance era was off to a fantastic start. And in the next video in this series, I'm going to be taking a look at all of the different variations of the Game Boy Advance that were released from 2001 all the way up until 2008. And if you love the GBA as much as I do, then I think you will really enjoy this video up here where I covered my top 15 games for the system. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this and I'll see you very soon for the next episode. Goodbye.